Okay, well, let's get started here. Um, my name is Josh Frome. I'm the Community and Economic Development Specialist for the City of Montpelier. Uh, thanks for joining us um, today for the third spring engagement session for the Country Club Road Project. Um, first, just want to just give everybody a reminder on um, what we are doing um, during this phase, which is we are master planning uh, the property. Um, and the master plan is, a, is going to be a living document. Um, it provides a roadmap um, to move the project forward. Um, think of it as um, you know, a document that lays out um, the framework of additional analysis to be performed in the next stage. Um, with recommendations. So the, the actual master plan itself is not just a conceptual plan. It'll be a, a whole document uh, with a bunch of different recommendations from the consultant team. Um, and so to kick us off uh, on this presentation uh, from our consultant team is Stephanie Clark from White and Burke. So take it away, Stephanie. Okay, thank you so much. Everybody can hear me. Great. Um, I'm gonna open my, um, I'm gonna use the, PowerPoint here, so um, apologies, you won't be able to uh, see us, all the people as much, but we'll, we'll shut this down so you can see everybody after, once we're, uh, once we're done with the presentation. Again, I'm Stephanie Clark with White & Bark Real Estate Advisors. I am the uh, consultant to the city, and I'm joined today by Dave Saladino from VHB, um, also on the consultant team, and our other team member is, I'm oh, sorry, um, Black River Design, who has also been contributing and consulting to the city. And we also have Evelyn Prim on, who is the communications coordinator for the city. And I believe Kelly Murphy, the assistant city manager, has also been joining us today. So we can field questions as needed as we finish. But we have a presentation for you today that will take a little bit of time to get through because there's a lot of content to update for anyone who's been following along with the process, but also orientation for anyone who hasn't been. And we appreciate you taking this time. It's a really important topic. It's a really important project in the city. And we appreciate you taking the time and the attention that this deserves. And we will try to get our way, make our way through the presentation fairly expediently, but try to hit the high points and then be able to answer a lot of question and answer at the end and take your input. So again, we everyone will remain muted until the end when we um, when we have time for Q and A and we'll answer questions then. So I will get us started here and. Really just, we're gonna walk through the process that we've been through, talk about the findings we had in our last sessions. If you participated over the winter or you just wanna hear what happened over the winter, we're gonna talk about the, um, the concepts and uh, the three concepts we're talking about. We're gonna go into some costs and we're gonna go into funding scenarios. And that part gets a little bit dense. So all these materials are on the website, this presentation, these, these slides are on the website. There is another, this is being recorded. Um, there's recordings of our previous two meetings. So if you have any questions that don't get answered today and you wanna do a little bit deeper dive and sit with it, um, that's perfectly okay. And we're gonna highlight what the survey, which is out right now, and we'll talk about that a little more, but we're gonna highlight what those survey questions are and what that's going to, uh, what we're asking of the community this time and hit what's in the actionable master plan before we open it up to Q&A. So to hit um, kind of the summary of our process with this master plan, since it was acquired last spring, the city took community input last spring and continued that through the fall and to listen to what the community was looking for, for priorities and uses at this site. Concurrently, the consultant team was working on due diligence and analysis of the site, looking at the natural resources and the different features of the physical, con the physical elements of the site as well. And then the winter brought a um, opportunity, it's called an opportunities and constraints plan forward to talk about what the different limits of the buildable areas were on the site and to get public input on all of that. Now we're in the spring stage and we're bringing forward the um, concept plans that actually reflect the, re the results and the feedback from our winter stage. And we are bringing this back through the council. Um, we've been bringing the city council along because ultimately this is a city council decision. The concept plan is a city council decision and what gets adopted into our actionable master plan. 
So essentially, just to sum up what this particular stage in the last, last bit of, this is called phase one, all of the work that our consultant team has been hired to do. This is um, where we are right now is the public meetings right in the center of the screen. You can see we're in our pu third public meeting. We've had two others. We have had a, a video online on the website that's a short nine minute video that we did to try to just hit the high level high highlights of this project. And we've released a survey that is available for folks to complete by the end of this week, which is May 12th. And then our plan is to submit our feedback to the council in a few weeks, next end of next week, and to meet with the council on the 24th. And at that point, the council is going to decide on a concept plan that gets incorporated into the actionable master plan. And the actionable master plan itself is to be presented at the end of June. So again, this is not a final land plan. There are many factors that are very subject to change as a result of time and due diligence and the next steps and the next phases that we have to do on this work. But it is a vision, as, as Josh said, it's a living document, it's a vision for the site. It really sets the tone for the scale and the, the density and the overall, um, the overall uses for the plan. But we know there is an immediate need for housing and recreation, which is what this site is being intended for. And there are, there's a housing crisis, there are recreational needs not being met, and there's more steps required until that point of construction, but there's also this really important need to be filled. So we're trying to balance this, this little bit of tension between being um, inclusive, thorough, and transparent with taking the appropriate um, steps with due diligence to move along expeditiously. So in the winter time, some of you have participated. I see some familiar names and faces. We had several meetings in the winter. We had a lot of attendees that came out for this. We conducted two different surveys, one of high school students, one of the community. We had lots of input and it yielded almost 12,000 data points because we, we were generating a lot of different conversations with stakeholders as well. And basically, the biggest support was for a balanced approach. They, in the winter, we had three different kind of test sketches of how the site could lay out, one that was more heavily housing, one that was more heavily rec. And really, the desire was to have something kind of balancing the two to address both of these really important needs for housing and indoor-outdoor recreation. The, the support was highest in housing for mixed product, so different product types that could serve a lot of different income levels, uh, have some variety of style. There was also a support uh, for balance with conservation, open space, incorporation of spaces for Abnaki recognition, celebration, and gathering. Also, a, a strong support for connecting wildlife corridors, strong support for connecting this site to the rest of the city, connecting this to abutting parcels, um, development opportunities and infrastructure in, abutting, in, in the abutting area. And there was strong support for energy efficiency and minimizing the impact to climate. Um, on top of that, minimizing the impact to taxpayers. So just a short list of all the most important things to everybody, which is a lot to try to accommodate. But we did our best and we have developed some concept plans, some concept alternatives, and Dave Saladino is gonna walk us through those in a moment, but essentially we have been able to incorporate a lot of that data and a lot of that input from everybody into some of the, into these concepts. And these will go forward to be incorporated into the actionable master plan. But what's not shown is the developer specifics. So getting into market analysis, for example, is not going to be part of these concept plans level of, of, of housing affordability or the exact housing product or specific technologies and design innovation, those are not gonna be incorporated here because that's really up to a developer to, to start to refine when they bring forward um, or a development partner to bring forward to um, when, they, when we go out for an RFP. Other things not shown, but will be considered in future phases are neighborhood amenities, things like amphitheaters and playgrounds and gazebos and gathering spaces. Those will emerge in future phases. This is not that level of detail. This is phase one concept planning. And specific locations of Abnaki recognition and celebration are not also reflected here because we, we are going to be recommending after meeting with a few representatives from uh, Abnaki tribes, we are going to be recommending a process that the city form with a working group 
of Abnaki stakeholders and city stakeholders to look for opportunities for incorporation in this site, but also citywide. So those are not shown yet, but rather the process has been established. We also wanna note that wildlife corridors have been accommodated in these concepts and will be accommodated in the final concept plan. They're just not specifically called out, but it's inherent in the site design. And also you'll note that in this, all three concepts, we have what's dedicated known as a community, recreation community zone. And that zone is a 12 acre area of the site that has been right sized based on all of the due diligence we've done so far, um, but is, actually being run and programmed on a separate but parallel process that the city is running. So the city is running a process on a concurrent path and timeline to create the, the uh, programming and address the demand for indoor and outdoor recreational uses within that space. So this looks at the balance of the rest of the 138, 130 something acres. And Dave is gonna walk us through what those concepts look like. I'm gonna give you my remote, Dave. Okay. Hey, let's see. Are you seeing my mouse now? We are. Okay. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, okay. I want to uh, walk through the three concepts as, as Stephanie alluded to. Um, these uh, concepts are very much a variation on a theme, as, as Stephanie alluded to. Uh, these came out of the, the feedback that we received from the first round, which really uh, drove that point home of kind of the mix of, of housing and recreation. And so uh, as we go through these concepts, I wanted to just start and um, identify some uh, common themes on or common elements on each of the plans, and then we'll get into some of the specifics on each of the three concepts. Uh, so just looking overall here, just to kind of orient uh, folks, um, we've got down here, this is Country Club Road, and the intersection with Route 2 is just at the bottom of the screen here. So coming up the hill, Country Club Road, you can see the former Elks Club building, this kind of white square just under the green area here. So that's, um, if you know where that building is, and kind of orient yourself, and then the rest of the site is here. Uh, the Route uh, 2 and 302 roundabout is down here in the corner, so hopefully that, that helps to, uh, to orient you. Uh, a couple other things here on the kind of in the base uh, background, but there's been quite a bit of uh, evaluation of just the site itself, um, the context. And so we are reflecting um, uh, a number of those things. So we've got uh, all of the stream channels and stream buffers are noted here with the blue lines and the white buffers around. Uh, we we want to make sure to uh, avoid any of those stream channels or, or buffer areas. We do have some wetlands and buffers that are noted here in this the lighter green. Uh, this dark purple line, which appears in all the on the concepts plans, uh, concept plans, is the uh, the proposed U32 trail. Um, a little bit uh, lighter here, these black dotted lines show proposed uh, trails, walking trails, walking paths as part of the uh, the community. And so you can see connecting kind of connections running throughout um, east and west and north and south. I uh, see this number six here. This is showing where those walking trails would tie into. Um, uh, the Country Club Road Trail, the Cross, Cross Mont Trail uh, at this point here. Um, as Stephanie was alluding to here, this great big green square here is a, the area that's been um, reserved for those future discussions around recreation and community uses. Uh, so this is that 12 acre zone um, uh, that Stephanie uh, was, was referring to. Um, the, the connections here, so off to the left here, uh, these dotted lines here show potential opportunities to extend the roadway connections, either uh, in this case to the west or to the north. Um, those are potential opportunities for connections. I uh, wanted to make sure we're showing where those locations could be found. Um, we have this darker green here. This is what's on this one shown as number seven. This is uh, where we're envisioning uh, uh, some type of community gathering space. Uh, as Stephanie alluded to, we haven't gotten, haven't at this point aren't getting down to the details of you know whether there's a gazebo here or play playground amenities, but this uh, location was identified as a nice central, uh, easily accessible area for the for the neighborhood. Um, and then just lastly, kind of one of the common uh, things to each of the plans are these the the trees that are shown here. So the green circles, um, these are all existing mature trees on the site. And um, so as we were getting into the, the layout of these concepts, we wanted to make sure we're preserving or um, uh, preserving uh, all of the existing mature trees on the site. There's some great uh, specimen trees out in this location. So we wanna make sure we're not uh, uh, bulldozing those down only to build, you know, put in smaller trees in their place. We really wanna, wanna respect the existing uh, trees that are out there. 
Um, what's not shown on here are, are future or additional landscaping amenities. You know, certainly as this community develops, want to want to add lots more trees and, and shrubs and other landscape plantings. That would come in a subsequent phase of design as this gets more um, kind of from the master plan into concept and, and construction level design. So with that, um, those are kind of the common common themes across the concepts. Um, we'll just talk through uh, each of the concepts and they're, they're fairly similar. So we can go, um, it will start to see kind of the differences between those as we go through. Uh, so uh, they all have a, a similar kind of spine roadway, which, which follows uh, largely the cart pass on the existing uh, country club. And so we've got this uh, on, in this concept uh, terminating in a turnaround here uh, location. So the, um, uh, the housing that's shown in this, this first uh, concept is comprised of two different uh, types of, of housing. Uh, what's shown on the kind of the northern side, the back, back side here are townhouses. And these could be uh, either uh, uh, duplex, triplex, or quadplex buildings, depending on you know, the market at the time, the size and the scale um, uh, that's in, uh, that is in uh, demand at the time. And then the other housing products shown here are the, the red uh, rectangles here. So this is closer to the entrance. These are all envisioned as five-story uh, multifamily apartment buildings. Um, each of these has uh, uh, a mix of one and two bedrooms. Uh, overall, across these five buildings, we see, you can see down here, about just under 200 units in those five, uh, in, I'm sorry, in the three five-story buildings here. And then as you see down here, as shown on the plan, we have 96 of the townhouse units. So this concept A, which is the has the most housing, the, high, the highest density of housing, is just under 300 total units, so 292 overall. Um, so that's that. Uh, that's uh, kind of an overview concept A. If we jump ahead here to concept B. Uh, we retain many of the same same elements. You can see the entrance uh, here coming uh, with the uh, the five story building, multifamily buildings around the entrance. I didn't note, but uh, also on concept A here, we, we do have some community gardens kind of ringed by those, um, those larger, uh, more dense housing. Uh, and then we retain this, uh, this stub of townhomes here, uh, this cluster of townhomes. Then the real, real uh, difference here in concept B is uh, rather than having townhomes here at the end of the roadway, we, we replace those with single family homes. Uh, there was some desire uh, in the surveys from the first round to have some portion of, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, of the area potentially reserved for single family homes. So concept B has that uh, integrated here. Uh, because single family homes are less dense, there's fewer of them per, per uh, acre. Uh, our total number of unit counts here does go down as we're swapping out townhomes for single family homes. So we went from uh, 292 in the previous one down to 268 units total here. And then concept C has the lowest density overall of the housing. Uh, you can see a similar similar kind of uh, layout to the roadway. Um, this initial uh, 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 cluster of housing here, this is a little bit less dense. So the retain the five story. So the C-shaped building here is a, envisioned as a five story apartment building. Uh, the other two facing it on uh, across the street would be three story buildings. Uh, so two three story buildings, so a little bit lower uh, overall and less uh, unit count here. So across these multifamily units, whereas before we had uh, just under 200, this has about uh, just over 130, 132 units in these um, uh, in this pod here. Uh, we we uh, replace what had been a, a townhouse pod here with some open space that could be used for a variety of things, potentially some additional uh, you know community recreation or just uh, some open space. And then we retain the townhomes uh, uh, further down towards the end of the end of the roadway. So overall here, we're under 200 units, so 184 total uh, as shown uh, on concept, uh, concept C here. So you can see the range as we're going from the most dense at about 300 units down to concept C, which is at, at uh, just over 180 units. I think that's it. I'm happy to answer questions, but um, uh, with that, I think we'll roll into, uh, into yeah. step. Thanks, Dave. Um, do you wanna speak a little bit about why the siting of multifamily was down a little bit lower um, yeah. instead of up, up higher. Yeah, yeah. So um, the uh, couple reasons why the kind of the most dense cluster of, of housing is located in this location here. Uh, one being this is one of the flattest locations on the site. So it makes sense for this kind of um, density of uses. Uh, two, it's closest to the entrance. And so this is where mo um, of, of the uses on the site as shown here, these will generate the most uh, auto trips in and out. 
And so the idea, if we can capture those trips closer to the entrance so that they're not driving in front of either um, you know, people's homes or other uses that are further back in the, um, on the site, uh, the idea is to really locate those uses as, as uh, close as possible to the entrance. Right, thank you. You will note um, if anyone um, has spent some time on the website looking at these at all, there is a summary down here on each of them talking about the, the coverage of each of these types of uses. And it shows that all three actually have 80% of the full site as non-impacted. And so there's a minimum um, on this concept C actually, it's, it's higher. So there's a large amount of preserved and open space on all three plans, which again, reflects what we heard during the, the, spring, the winter and the fall sessions of feedback. I will also note that the trails that are shown on all of these plans, um, those are the dashed lines here, and those are all conceptual still. They have not been fully designed or anything with the parks department, but that would be a further step that would happen in the later phase as well. So really the, you know, very, the, the three options are really variations on a theme coming out of that winter phase stage where we had the most support for unanimous, you know, um, overwhelming support, support for test sketch C. And it really shows a strength of process that there's been a lot of consensus built around some of the density, scale, and overall uses that are here. So at this point, it is appropriate for us to get into the issue of cost. And the scope of phase one and our team's charge was to provide high level estimates of costs. So again, we have to look at these from a city perspective. So this is the city's investment into the infrastructure to support housing. So this is not the city building housing, and this does not include that recreation component that we that is shown in that um, zone, but rather this is to support additional housing. The city is getting invested in this. The reason the city took this on in general is to be a catalyst of the kind of housing the city wants to see here. And so we go with the cons most conservative for the purposes of this discussion at phase one of this process, we are looking at what's the most conservative and most the highest cost to the, to the city if we were to do all the infrastructure ourselves not asking for a developer to do it so that the developer has the feasibility to do the type of housing we want. This is the, these are just the baseline assumptions. This does not though reflect any individual units or driveways or other amenities that the developer will build. So we looked at what it would cost for the city to build on-site infrastructure. So you can see those costs here. Um, kind of show you this little area line by line. It also includes, and those you can see, differ between the three scenarios, but the A and B are quite similar. Because as Dave showed you, the spine of the road, the road infrastructure is generally the same, is, is the same for both A and B, but C is where it starts to differ. Similarly, if the option were to go with concept sketch C, there would not likely be a roundabout or signal needed. It's possible, but not as likely as the other two because of that's when the trips threat uh, trip the threshold for the amount of, in, of traffic to go through that intersection. So there is a differential there. Once you get down to offsite costs, actually there's no difference because these are all the, the costs it would take at any of these three densities to support the site, to support this level of development at the site. So building uh, upgrades to the pump station and building out the water sewer lines, upgrading them to the site itself, as well as we've already, bought the site as the city, and that purchase has been made. Um, we'll get into the financing of that, but the, the city already voted on it. There's already a bond for the purchase. And we're assuming that between the three, it's gonna take the same amount of legwork, the same amount of due diligence. This has not yet, we've not yet spent that amount of money by any means, but rather that will be what it would take to get the due diligence done for any of the scenarios. So you have these three costs, the A and B being 18.8 .8 million and 15.3 million for concept C. What I'm gonna do, we'll get to takeaways at the end, but what um, I'm gonna do is to talk for a moment about how could the city be able to fund this and not impact the taxpayer or what impact to the taxpayer would there be? So we looked at some funding scenarios. These are by no means 
set in stone. The costs that I just showed you also not set in stone. That is, these are high level order of magnitude estimates in 2023. We expect that this isn't going to be built for a few more years at, at a minimum. That would take that the, we have to take into account any inflation or any other changes, any changes that come about as a result of the future due diligence would also affect the cost. So we really aren't asking anyone to get wedded to those numbers exactly, but rather look at it on an order of magnitude in a comparison perspective. So when we talk about the funding of it, similarly, these are hypotheticals. So we have a million dollars has already been invested to purchase the site from the Recreation Reserve Fund. We know that much. We also can assume that we will seek grants and there's lots of grants available at any given time, but right now we don't know exactly which grants those could be. There's Northern Borders Regional Commission grants, there are recreational grants for trails, there's congressional earmarks, those types of things that will not be known until we're ready to break ground, but we've made some assumptions in these, in these scenarios. We're also, like I said, assuming no developer contribution in any of the scenarios we're showing you today, but it's very likely that when we do put out an RFP, we could ask for a purchase price of these individual lots, we could ask for their contribution to extend some of the infrastructure themselves, there's ways to do, there could be impact fees, there's ways to do a financing structure with a developer, but that's something we absolutely want to wait to see how it emerges as part of the partnership. And then we're going to talk about two financing mechanisms. One is TIF, which is tax increment financing, and the other is using water sewer fees. So we'll talk about that. Again, this is a little bit dense. I encourage you to look at the slides yourself when you have time, but also there's recordings of this and other presentations. We've done the same presentation a couple other times if you want to go back and rewatch it to, to break it down. So essentially what we're talking about is if we have this total infrastructure cost, as we talked about, the 18.8 million and the 15.3 for concept C, if we assume a million dollars has been invested and brings down that cost overall because it's been invested by the reserve fund, and then we could assume about a million five in possible grants. That's an assumption ballpark for now. That gives us a gap of 16.3 million for A or B or 12.8 million for concept C. So those are the you know, nuts to crack when it comes to looking at different options for financing. So I'm gonna take a moment and focus on TIF, what tax increment financing is, and what this means, what are two, two different options the city could have to make, um, to use this, this mechanism. TIF is an instrument that a municipality can use to fund infrastructure, essentially, but only to fund infrastructure that's going to generate new development. So essentially a town or a city can bond for some piece of public infrastructure and then the resulting development, the private development that happens as a result, at direct result of that infrastructure has new taxes and those new taxes pay down the bond. So it happens in this cycle. And there are lots of examples of this done across the state. We have um, examples in Barrie, in St. Albans, Burlington, Hartford, Killington's doing one right now, Bennington's doing one right now. And they're very successful models when done right. And in other parts of the country, there's been examples of it done wrong, but it's when it's done right, it's done in partnership. So the city and the entity go in lockstep in a public-private partnership, and they build the infrastructure that has a known revenue source from those taxes. So in the municipal version, you would just retain your municipal taxes from those new development projects to pay down your infrastructure. But there's also a state program. And the state program, if you get a designation, you go through a rigorous application process, you're allowed to retain up to 70% of the at general fund, um, sorry, education fund taxes of those new development projects. Again, it's only the new infrastructure, the new development and new infrastructure that you'd be generating taxes on. And what I mean by that is it's but for the city making an investment into the infrastructure, this development project wouldn't have happened. And if it wouldn't have happened, you wouldn't have those taxes anyway. But because you do, you can retain 70% of those unit of those education fund taxes to pay down the infrastructure. So this tries to get at how much revenue these different scenarios could produce, because as Dave said, concept A has 292 units, but concept C has only 184 units. 
So if we assume conservatively a flat tax rate, just using today's tax rate and projecting it over 20 years, you see municipal taxes and state taxes. And these are the total volume taxes that would be generated over those 20 years by, the, by each scenario. If you were to use, if the city were to use a municipal only TIF, where it takes those taxes from just these properties, just this development to help pay down the taxes, you can see that again, we have these, these infrastructure costs. This is the remaining amount to be funded. So 16.3 million and 12.8 million. You have some interest costs because you'd be bonding for it. So you've got cost of financing. And then you take those revenues and you devote the revenue entirely to tank, paying down the debt service, you, you decrease that gap by quite a bit, down to 2.9, up to 5.7, depending on the concept. So you can see how we start to chip away at that cost to the taxpayer, because this would not affect the tax rate. If we can get it down to zero, it doesn't affect the, the tax rate. There's no bond for the taxpayers to pay. And then further, what we've decided, what we looked at, and this, Section here is the exact same section we just saw. So you've got that 2.9 up to the 5.7 as your gap. What would happen if you devoted the water sewer user fees toward the water sewer infrastructure on site and you factor in some cost of financing, you get to this point with, co with concept A, it means that there would be zero cost to the taxpayer it, to fund all that infrastructure just using those two financing mechanisms. Or if you concept B, you'd see about $2.1 million gap to be closed, whether that's done with any kind of grant funding or whatnot, that would then close that gap. So again, we're just showing this as a theory more than anything for folks to think about. Again, a state TIF retains 70% of that education fund increment over, over and above what you retain from your municipal, municipal revenue. So what we're looking at here is the remaining amount to be funded, the 16.3 million and the 12.8, add in your cost of financing, your, your debt, then you retain that, that portion from the state. And actually in these situations, you actually have a surplus and the way you could package it could be that it's incentivizing to you to establish recreation um, at this site if you establish a recreation center or a facility or um, other uses in that recreation zone, there's actually a surplus of generated taxes that could help expand your bond capacity. So you could have additional capacity to invest this amount, these amounts to the recreation uses. Again, I know that's a lot of information. I know it's pretty dense, but the whole, I'll get to the takeaways. And for the cost takeaway, high level, a and B, you saw comparable city cost. There's comparable cost because there's comparable infrastructure between the two concepts. Concept C, though, is overall 20% less to fund. However, it also has the fewest housing units. So if you look at that by unit, in concept A, you actually have the cheapest cost to the city. So this is the city's cost of infrastructure to invest, to, to generate these units at 47,000, but in concept C, it's actually 56,000. So it's really more costly per unit. And again, just the recreation and community zone is not known at this phase because that's being undertaken under a separate process. But those costs will be, once they're known, this will all become part of the bigger takeaway, which we'll talk about in a minute. So just from the financing perspective, as I said, this is high level, we're doing gross order of magnitude, and there's a lot of unknowns, but the takeaway should be that if we were to use a municipal only TIF, which is within the city's power to implement, plus water sewer user fees, you actually cover most of the cost, which is great. If you could get a state TIF, which is authorized by a, a, a department of the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, that could cover the entire cost and possibly have a surplus capacity if you package it the right way, to fund some, some recreational uses there too on the site. But as I mentioned, more due diligence is needed. And once we get into further phases of planning, it could be clear that there's additional costs that haven't been considered too premature to consider now, but it could also increase your possible funding sources. Different funding sources might become available in the next few years, we don't know. So more will also evolve as uh, development partners are selected 
and that and the recreational programming is developed, which can generate um, income as well. So there's a lot of things that are still unknown, but this gives you the overall big picture. The city will continue to look for these costs and these uh, at the costs and looking for funding streams, but ultimately the city voters, it, this will come back to the city voters if there is any kind of bond to be issued, but that's not what's happening at phase one. In phase one where we are right now is not a vote on spending. We are not in asking for incurring any debt. Rather, we are focused on finishing phase one, <clears throat> creating the vision for what the uses should be on the site so that we can take the next steps with due diligence for phase two. The survey that will be up till Friday asks two questions. One is to rank choice the concepts we, we showed, A, B, or C, and in your order of preference, and also to help the parallel process with the recreation and community zone, it's asking to rank support whether or not you actually support a, a facility, a building, a rec building on this site or not. And so that those are the two questions we're asking for. Almost, almost complete here. Um, the last uh, two points here, one is the actionable master plan, which is what's going to be issued in June covers a lot more than just that concept plan. The concept plan is an illustrative vision, vision um, representation, but the document is actually comprehensive to include all of these pieces that you see on the screen and, and more. Um, we know, for instance, we have to have further conversations with the railroad because there's a railroad crossing as we, we get onto the site. We know we have to have further conversations with, uh, as I say here, forming an Amnaki working group. Um, we know that we need to look and explore different transit options because this is outside of the downtown. We're also looking at rezoning and then to be able to do that before you apply for a growth center expansion because this is not within the growth center but it is clearly within the, the city's intention to make this part of the growth center and then you need those before you can even apply for a TIF district. So with that I'm just going to leave it that we're asking everyone here to please take the survey that's the number one thing. It, if you'd like to review the concept plans again on the website there's also an FAQ on the website as of today with some questions we've heard over the last few weeks, especially from the previous public sessions we've had and from city council. So there's some good FAQs that you can also refer your friends to. So if you have neighbors and friends who are interested in this, please let them know. There's lots of information on the website. These sessions have all been recorded. There's a video that's less than 10 minutes for them to watch. There's um, the FAQ and we'd really appreciate them taking the survey. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share, whoops, so that we can see one another. And um, Josh, I think you're gonna moderate questions, but we can take questions I can pull slides back up as needed. Yep, uh, and just to get people in the queue for questions, uh, please use the raised hand function um, that you can find in your reactions at the bottom there. Um, so just raise your hand and we will call on you. Um, thank you. Allie, we can start with you. Hi. Yes, hi, hi. Um, so this is a maybe a minor question, I don't know. Um, but to start with, the, the three um, plans the maps are actually not consistent. Um, one of the things that I noticed on concept C is that there's a wetland and buffer zone um, noted right above the community space, neighborhood gathering space. And that buffer zone is, um, wetland and buffer zone is not noted on the other two concepts. There are trails going through that. And I don't know if that's, I don't know how to think about that. I'll let Dave pop in with that um, response here. You're muted, Dave. Sorry about that. Um, that is a very good point. Um, uh, it's not in, it's not incorrectly labeled. What what is shown on um, if you look closely, if you have it up, um, if you look at concept C, you can see just uh, above the W in wetland and the D in the word and. There's kind of the little white uh, semicircles that head north. So th that's what those are labeling, the white buffers. And so in concept B, that does 
All right, I guess here we go. Sorry, I um, took me a minute. Do you want C or B up? Um, well, I guess if we do B, like I can show B where. Yeah. And I'm going to give you remote control. Go ahead. Okay. Oops. So it's really these, it's, it's, it's really hard to see at the scale, but these little white, um, these are the buffers here. So there's, there's a currently culverts. This is part of the cart path for the, the um, uh, golf course. And so the, the, these streams are not above ground here, as it's shown here, they do go underground. So the wetland and buffers are just north and, and then just south, if you can see that white area. Um, it just got too busy to put that, the words uh, wetland buffer. So those words are talking about these little white areas. Does that make sense? It, it does make sense, but it, it runs into some other issues. Like right now, the, um, the Montpelier Conservation Commission is in the process of, of marking out vernal pools for um, amphibious um, protected species. And that area may be part of, you know, I, I, we don't know yet what's happening in that area. I, so for me, I don't know how close to, I don't know whether that's going to have an impact on this U32 trail that you've put in or, or the, the housing sites and in, in concepts A and B, but that might be part of what you're talking about for phase two. I, I don't know. I don't know how to think about it. So. Mm -hmm. I will note we did we did do a full wetland delineation of the of the site, and so all of those areas and the buffers that are noted were based on a um, wetland delineation that was done last fall. So those are fairly fresh, uh, recent delineations. Right, but I'm talking about well, okay, I'm talking uh, about other pool. vernal vernal pools, which yeah. you may not have seen when you did it because of definitely not not in the fall. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Callie. Um, we'll go to Paige next, and then Norita. And if you'd say your full name and, and where you're from, it would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, Paige Gurton. I'm in Montpelier. Um, this is a lot to catch up on, <laughs> and I need to uh, I need to spend some time looking and reading. But my um, I, I just got back to a trip from a trip to Scotland, and I noticed that probably 95% of the houses in Europe and places like that are townhomes. And so I'm actually really glad that you have uh, concepts that are the majority townhomes and not individual houses. I think there will be individual single family homes left after people from Montpelier move over here, maybe that want to downsize. So I'm not sure we need single family homes. But the other thing that struck me is that I would recommend facing all the buildings, not toward the road, but to the south so that potentially they can get even passive solar gain and possibly some solar uh, rooftop solar down the road. So rather than facing, and I'm pretty sure the zoning for that area, if there um, has the buildings facing the road, which um, I think is a mistake. So that's just a thought. Um, uh, just rotate the buildings. The C-shaped building should also be oriented to the south, and then you'd have a nice warm courtyard area in there, even in the wintertime that would get sunshine. So just a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Huge amount, um, huge amount of work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, thank you. And yes, it is a lot to catch up on. So um, Josh is also, his email's right on the website. If you have further questions, follow-up questions, right. he's available. Um, I did want to mention that, yes, the orientation of the buildings is a good one, is a good example, because in the actionable master plan itself, there are some recommendations from our team to the city about the RFP that's going to need to go out to the developers. So a developer will make those ultimate decisions about orientation but it's also relative to zoning. So you make a good, two good points because there's the zoning that's going to have to be written for this area that hasn't been that hasn't been updated yet. And also then, so they'll have to comply with zoning, but also we're encouraging that there are main major goals of the city. And one of them is minimizing impact on climate. So the developer is going to be, and because the city's in control of this parcel, we have some control over saying, which developer gets the project and the developer who brings forward a project that is taking those things into effect into account is going to have a higher ranking, including, yeah, rooftop solar opportunities, as well as more creative um, possible, you know, technologies incorporating things like geothermal technologies or other emerging technologies that um, 
quite frankly, in two years or three years or four years and then beyond when these further parcels might be developed, we don't even know yet. So we don't wanna be prescriptive necessarily at this stage in the plan, but really making the point that it's gonna rank higher for the city to evaluate these development proposals if they're focusing on minimizing impact to climate. So we'll go to Norita and then Susan. If you just unmute yourself, pop on. Hi, um, yeah, sorry, I'm not getting my camera to work, but my name is Nora and I live in Montpelier, very close to where the site is. A couple of comments is, first of all, I'm not completely clear on when and how you're bringing in um, the indigenous Abenaki group. Um, are they being involved hopefully sooner, obviously, than the city council decisions? Because it's not just enough, obviously, to just leave this little area for ceremonial and ritual things, but to actually get them to give an enormous amount of input on this entire project. So that's first comment. Um, the second thing is in terms of the A, B, and C plans, if all of the townhomes, for example, and the one to two bedroom units, are those rentals or are those for purchase? And if those units are rentals, how are we as the city and community going to keep the rentals low income available? Um, who's paying the taxes on those buildings? If you know, there's, for example, Downstreet, if that's one of the partners that's going to be doing this development, how many of those units can actually be designated low income? Then with that, if they're low income, they probably will not have cars. What about the infrastructure to and from into the city? Um, is there going to be a grocery store, a small community store that they can get groceries there on site? Um, things like that, then the infrastructure of how to get to and fro, is there going to be a free train or a shuttle that goes into the city, Green Mountain Transport or whoever. Sorry, I just dumped a bunch of ideas. <laughs> that's okay. That's good. No, that's great. It, those were the two main questions. I've got sub questions that you said as well that I'll respond to. Um, so yeah, the um, good question on the Abnaki group, we have met with representatives from um, two different tribes a few times already here in the last few stages of this phase. And we are originally, we actually had some spaces on the plans designated as possible areas for celebration or recognition or education. And we ended up taking them off the plans because it became clear that it needs to be a much more collaborative process, that it needs to be much more um, like a working group. And so the recommendation in our master plan is for the city to form the working group with city stakeholders, but also with representatives and that they would then look for opportunities on this site, but also citywide, because there's other parks, there's other spaces that might be better suited for certain uses versus this site. And we don't want to prescribe that from the city's perspective, that's not appropriate. So um, this is a um, collaborative process we've 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 set up at the at the from now. Um, and then you asked the question about rentals versus purchase. So we don't know yet that that's going to have to come forward when the developer comes forward to put forward their proposal. Um, what's the what's the ownership structure and then at that time, the taxes will be paid by the developer because we're intending to subdivide this. This is not, city is not in the business of building housing. So the city would be subdividing these parcels and selling them to a private developer so that they do start paying the taxes. And the um, exact structure of whether, you know, what proportion are rentals versus owned will have to be evaluated by the city at the time when the proposals come forward. And there'll be many factors that might influence that. And so between financial feasibility to do the project, but also based on the market at the time. Um, again, we can't know in 2023, what 2025, 27, 29 might look like in terms of the demand. So we're being um, open to the market piece of that. You asked about though transit and retail are both really good, good points. I did not mention the retail. I did say in transit, we absolutely know that's a component, not just for the housing people, piece, but for the recreation piece, how do you get people to and from the site who want to recreate there, especially youth 
Um, so, you know, between the bike path connectivity, um, like you said, Green Mountain Transit, um, these accesses to other parts of the, you know, how do we connect over maybe to Sabin so that we can connect more west into downtown. Those are all important due diligence items forthcoming. But retail is one I forgot to mention. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, we have put in the master plan that based on feedback and based on our recommendations, very small scale retail is the only appropriate retail for this space. It's not something where we're going to want to do um, recommending any like large scale commercial, as you can see on the mass on the concept plans. But absolutely small, first floor mixed use. Excuse me within the building to serve the community is appropriate and that will be accepted. Excuse me. So we'll go on to Susan and then Deborah. So I had some of the same questions as Nora about rental versus um, ownership and, uh, and realized that that also ends up affecting um, budget expectations, you know, in terms of when you're calculating the amount of revenue that the city is going to, and we don't know that now, I realize that. So I, I need a little clarification on what it means that the council is going to be making a decision on this on May 24th. What does that mean? Okay, let me write down both of these. Um, the affordable, um, piece, by the way, yes, it could affect the taxes that we could generate, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, both the, um, in the, it depends on the type of st structure. I mean, you know, if you have inclusionary zoning in certain communities, for example, the taxes aren't affected by that. I mean, it's, um, uh, sometimes they're not affected by that. So just keep in mind, and if, it, if it's a nonprofit that does the development, they often do, um, a different structure of taxes, but they're still paying taxes. So just keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Because um, we see that in TIF a lot in tax increment financing, you're relying yep. on the tax generation, but affordable housing is one of the goals. So it's like, how do you make that math make sense? And so it is a component, but it's not a deterrent. I shouldn't, I just don't want it to appear that it's um, a, a deal breaker. You know, affordable housing and tax ge generation are not exclusive. Um, and then Sorry, what was your second question? I couldn't finish. Well, so I, I'm what sorry. I'm trying to what I'm trying to figure out or understand better is, so you've got this survey. It's closing on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, then the council, oh, the council. makes That's some right. kind of decision on May yeah. 24th. That's right. And and if I'm understanding it right, they're going to pick one of these three options and tell you know Burke and White to move forward on engineering and all mm -hmm. the next steps. Is that correct? Yeah, they will be okay. taking into account the survey data and the input we get during these sessions and during the um, outreach that we've been doing for the last few weeks. And we're going to package that in our recommendations to the to the city for their decision, ultimate decision on one of the three plans to be incorporated into our master plan. Yes. Right. But given the given how much none of us know, I, either. Mm -hmm you know, those of you doing the initial planning and those mm -hmm. of us that are supposed to fill out a survey and I filled out the earlier one, I, it, there is so much we don't know. So you're okay. asking us so, sort of to go into like a big shop and tell us all the things that we'd like to buy, having no idea what it's gonna cost, having no idea what the end product looks like. And, I, and that concerns me greatly because it feels to me like we're, putting the cart before the horse. And and so could you talk about that a little bit? Because mm -hmm. yeah. I, I find it troubling, very troubling, actually. So the the concern had um, <clears throat> hits on a couple of notes. And um, essentially, excuse me, uh, we've got two elements here. One is this is master planning. So you have to have some sort of direction to go in in order to set up due diligence steps. If you don't have a vision and a direction to go in, how do you know what to explore? So as a good example of that, we can't go to any of the state agencies and talk about impacts like the primary ag soil impacts or wetlands or streams without some sort of site plan, without some sort of impact plan to show them where do we wanna see development. And that very much could have could have varied along this process, it could still vary between the three different plans. So we need to be able to have a plan to show them to be able to take the next steps. But master planning 
<clears throat> in general is iterative. It has to be because you have to look into the due diligence for each of these steps before you can bring back any of your findings to be able to rule out yes or no's. But more importantly, we're not making a decision at this point. We're not asking you to buy all of those things in the store, for example, right now, but rather in a few years when the bond actually is before the voters to decide where to spend money if there's a cost to taxpayers, that's the point at which there's going to be more opportunities for, for input to city council before a decision is made to actually bond for anything. But right now, it's all about research and planning, excuse me, based on this, you know, initial concept. And so we need to have a direction, we need to have a vision. And if you don't have a vision, you're chasing something without any kind of input from the community. Because in some ways, you know, what I've done uh, in a lot of my career is commercial development. And if you have a private client, they tell you what they what you want, they want to build, and you figure out how to build it. But in this case, this is a public process. And there are, you know, thousands of stakeholders. So we couldn't just say what the city would, would like to build or what White Burke thinks you should build there, but rather get a sense of what everyone wants to build, then go figure out how much how much of that is feasible and then come back with a, co with a real cost. Now we tried to do order of magnitude costs so that people could understand this could become an $18 million project for this component, but also here are some possible revenue sources. So it starts to look at the impact without asking any for anybody to put their money where their mouth is yet. And at what time, at what point does the developer come in? Because the develop, it, it, we can have the best, you know, we can say we'd love to have these 10 things and the developer comes in and says, I can't make that work for anywhere near the cost you're telling me I need to fit into. Exactly. Yeah. And part of what this is all about is creating the menu of what we could offer a developer and what we can offer development partners. I really wanna be specific about that because I think developer suggests one big entity trying to do this, but it could be partnerships with Downstreet, it could be partnerships with um, Habitat for Humanity, it could be you know all kinds of different um, partners that come forward. It could be multiple partners for multiple parts of the site, I should say, as well as somebody who came in to do the whole thing. And we need to understand what our options are as the city to be able to offer so that we can generate the interest we want to get creative. And then it's a negotiation. So you asked when, and I don't have a specific date in mind because we haven't gone through the next few phases. How long is it going to take to rezone it? How long is it going to take to get the growth center designation? How long is it going to take to get through conversations with Act 250? Those are all things that are beyond our capacity to know, but we expect you know, at least a year out or more to issue an RFP. And at that time, it really um, will depend on that negotiation at that time to figure out what can be done. And a lot of that will depend on the market. So, you know, for example, if we had had this conversation three years ago and then pandemic hit, market changed, market demand changed beyond just the construction cost environment. So there's a lot that could change, but we can't have this process and be transparent without saying that it's going to change. And that's a hard place to be. So I recognize, I recognize the challenge and it's a, it's a balance that we're trying to strike as best we can. Yeah, I understand that. Um, Deborah and then Callie again. Hi, uh, I'm sorry, Deborah Messing. Bob could talk too. Bob could talk. <laughs> I didn't mean to say just Deborah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, from Montpelier. So I'm aware that uh, early on the community, uh, the community said that we were interested in verticality. That that was a, an important concept. Um, and I'm, but I'm a little bit concerned about the five stories. I don't know if I'm the only one out there uh, with this concern. It seems to me to be uh, sort of out of scale with the city and out of scale with the landscape. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, is it possible to, oh, but I do wanna say that First and foremost, I am uh, concerned about climate and environmental impact. So my question is, is it possible to achieve similar um, environmental 
impact uh, actually similar economies uh, with somewhat lower buildings, perhaps. I know on, on the one, the on the one plan, there's a five story and a three story. Uh, so what about two, four stories? Or just is there some way of achieving uh, some kind of um, similar economic impact with a lower building? A good question. Um, I mean, I think you've, you've basically answered part of your own question, which is like it, going up is going to help the, the financial feasibility to do more dense housing, right? And so to accomplish those still those same density goals, um, particularly because this density was selected out of that winter process. It's not the 500 that we saw on test sketch A back in the winter, where it was that super high density, but just to get within 180 to 300 units, which is a more modest density, um, it's going to take this verticality or it's going to compromise one of those other goals of the city, which was around conservation, open space, and impact to environment. So um, to get the density, there's a vertical component. That being said, what I think we should keep an open mind about, and I hear your, com your concern because I think one of the things we would love to do, and it's one of my, um, I, I don't know why I dream about this, but having, <laughs> I wish we could have a holographic ability to model on sites because how incredible, like, I think that's going to happen. I really do, at least in my son's lifetime, right? Like it's to have some sort of sense of scale is so important because we just don't know going out on the site when we were on site a couple weeks ago, I guess it's not this past weekend, but the weekend before for the first public meeting, Dave was able to say like, that's the direction of this building. And it was a rainy day, so we couldn't fly a balloon, but sometimes you can fly a balloon up and get to see like where the, the height of the building could be. And it's so different when you're on site versus seeing it in a plan or just thinking about it. But it also matters, Deborah, what you were saying kind of hits, a, hits home of like, how, how it's done. Because design, as you, you've you actually shown me some designs that are really creative. And so, you know, when we're talking about these plans, we're, we're on a concept level still. We're very much in concept planning phase one. But when a developer comes forward with their proposal, that's going to be the time when the city can evaluate the actual visual impact. And they're going to have to go through DRB and all of that at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be where the rubber hits the road. But really, there's some creative ways. I mean, I'm thinking about the, the hillside. You know, you've got, how could you utilize building more into the hillside to be able to minimize those impacts? So there's some creative yeah. stuff out there. We're not designers on that level. You know, so we want to reserve the right that there's better developers. And the other thing, I think it was actually you that sent me maybe one of the links for um, a different development that happened up here in, in Chittenden County. And one of the things... We, could, we will do as my recommendations in the master plan is to send the RFP to specific developers. Ooh. Like go seek out the ones you like, you know, yeah. city, you know, who are doing creative things. Don't just, if you build it, they will come blast it to the community, you know, into the ether, but rather, you know, seek out some people. They could be Northeast, you know, they could be East Coast. They could be Vermont based. They're probably more likely Vermont based because it's not a huge scale project, but find the ones that are doing some creative stuff and get that in their hands so that they really do present something that's more creative. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Callie, that's back to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I, I just first want to say thank you to Susan and Deborah and you for the conversation, the level of conversation we're having today. It's it's great to hear. I agree with everything Deborah and Susan were saying, and your fleshing it out, Stephanie, has been really helpful. Okay, so now I want to get down to a teeny weeny thing. <laughs> Again, I go for the little things. Um, and what I'm thinking about in, in comparing I'm thinking of, of concepts A and B as kind of comparable um, financially. And then C shows a really different picture. And one of the very small pieces of convenience in my life, because this is my neighborhood, you know that, that much of this property is on my property line, um, is tell me about this idea of the traffic light because I'm looking at the distance from Country Club Road to the roundabout 
And in some of the materials that I was reading, I don't remember exactly where I read it, it's either a traffic light or a roundabout. So are we looking at a traffic light, then you know, a minute later, a roundabout or two roundabouts? Or I, I can't, I can't, yeah. And I'm also thinking of what's gonna happen on that road for traffic. I can give this to Dave and <laughs> save my voice for a minute. Your He's girl. the traffic engineer. There you go. <laughs> Knowing when to delegate to the other pros. Here you go. Oh, really? <laughs> and just don't forget to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. A uh, good question. Um, the wording, the, uh, I guess, just to start the high at the at the high end, the wording signal roundabout is really just to leave the options open. Um, that is also it's one of um, the state's protocols. Is whenever whenever a signal is is found to be needed at a certain intersection, a roundabout all right. also has to be looked at. So that's kind of the alternatives that are that are evaluated. Um, for conservative pricing purposes, we did include the cost for the roundabout, which is more the more expensive of the two. Um, so, you know, looking at around about at about two, two and a half million, a signal about half a million. So, so a good bit less, less money. Um, the decision on that would be a community decision, well, and, and a state decision since, since route two is a state right of way. So as this process moves forward, that there would certainly be much more engagement with VTrans and the, and the city to talk through kind of options and alternatives. So that's, that's kind of when you alluded to the two, that's, that's why those both are listed there. Um, and in terms of overall operation, this would have to be designed, you know, a, a, a traffic engineer would typically look at, you know, the projected volumes on Route 2, how much uh, will be coming down the hill from this development, and we'll have to design the intersection to address traffic into the future. So the idea is that all of that gets worked out as part of the analysis before anything opens up so that you don't end up, you know, on opening day having queues that back up. So the 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 nature of the improvements will address any of those projected future volumes uh, so that there isn't congestion on route two. Okay, I, I think I understood all of that from a again on site, being in the moment right there, from a practical perspective as a driver on route two, trying to get to my occupational therapist at 1311, um, how how much am I gonna have to like be hiccuped? Um, just to just to get there. So I guess what I'm saying is that one of the a, attractions of Concept C is that we don't have to interrupt traffic along Route Two, where it already gets congested with the box stores and other things, and you know whatever's going on on the other side of the road. Um, because if we then start to either put in a traffic light or another roundabout. And literally a minute less than a minute later, there's another one of those traffic interruptions. Um, it becomes problematic. That that's that's what I'm saying. I I understand the need for it in concepts A and B. Um, what I'm saying is that I think concept C becomes more attractive for anybody who has to travel those roads because we're not. Um, yeah, we don't have to worry about a traffic light or a, a roundabout. Sure. And again, I think um, the other piece of it is, you know, oh, two things actually that this sparks. One is the DRB will be reviewing this whenever it comes mm -hmm. forward. So there's an opportunity there to be talking about the traffic impacts. But the other piece is that it's very likely this will happen in phases <laughs> and that, you know, depending on the market, depending on the feasibility, you know, can we achieve 300 units? Can we achieve 180? Um, to be determined in part because we have to see what the feasibility looks like for the city, but in part the feasibility for the developer. So, you know, this is visionary and it, because of the way we've laid the, the, the plan out, it can be done in phases. So the city could do the first part. And if the, if the other two nodes don't happen for whatever reason, you know, then we don't need the, the traffic light. It's not like it's going to go in day one, um, the, the, the roundabout or the signal. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Ben, you are up. You'd unmute yourself. We can. Oh, we can't hear you. Ken, sorry. You did. I can't hear you. That again. Let's try hey, that. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Um, oh. Regarding the roundabout light issue. Um, the plans A and B called for one or the other. C was a possible. 
And my concern is having the cost of that left out of C, if that is a possible, um, it kind of puts the plans A and B on an unlevel playing field with C in terms of popularity and overall cost. Um, so from my standpoint, it would be, if it is a possibility, put it in there, put it into the formula and have it there as a more true comparison and put in a notation may not be necessary or may be avoided or something to that effect, but uh, to leave it out and say it as a possibility down the road isn't really putting the plans on, on the same level. And just one other question, as, as far as the surveys go, how many have you received or do you know, do you have a count on how many you have received in this latest version? That's up to Josh. Um, uh, I think there is around 110, 115. Okay. Yeah, and last survey we had almost 600 um, responses. And so, you know, our promotion materials and our promotion efforts and it's, um, you know, this week are ramping up a lot and we've got other efforts that we're working on to get to get responses. But we also acknowledge, and it's something that's known in community development, how difficult it can be to get people to respond to surveys as the weather gets nicer. It's a, it's a fact of, it's just a part of the planning process, which is unfortunate for the timing. Although um, I will say that we particularly constructed this, um, this process to run during non-summer when, you know, some, when the participation is the lowest and the time of a lot of input that we really needed that was a very much directional to get us to this point was done over the winter. So that we did get them the most we could along the way. So it was done intentionally and there are inherent um, drawbacks and, and challenges to, to getting input. So that was one thing we're working on. Dave, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah. I, intersections? Yeah, I, I think it was a fair comment. Uh, one thing just to, to note, um, based on our traffic analysis, kind of um, uh, looking at current traffic volumes on Route 2 and estimating how many trips would be generated by these different concepts, what we saw is about 280 units approximately being that, that threshold, which gets traffic volumes to a point where a, a traffic signal roundabout is warranted. Um, and so 280 being that break point, um, uh, uh, concept A has 292, so that's over 280. Concept B has 268, just uh, slightly under 280, so that one felt fairly confident. And then C is 184, so that's about 100 units less than where we found that break point to be. So I, I think we felt fairly comfortable in leaving that price out, but um, it, you know, it, there is that asterisk. This is all still conceptual on those numbers. You know, the volumes on Route 2 change year to year. And so even if that the, the volumes on Route 2 go down a little bit, maybe you could get 300 units without having to add a signal. You'd have to you'd have to run the numbers at the time when you're looking at it. But we, we think it's somewhere around 250 to 280 units is that trigger point. Okay. Peter, you're up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Peter Kelman, okay. Montpelier. Um, uh, I, I've attended parts or all of all three of these sessions, and they've all been terrific. And I want to compliment Stephanie on the job she's done, and uh, I express my gratitude to the for the baby waiting a bit. Um, however, I think that the reason you only have 110 or so surveys filled out, and the reason why there have been so few attendees relatively at these three events, is that the the PR for this has been weak. And I've had people complain that say, and I've heard this from a number of people, that they will not fill out the survey because they're being required to give their information to a company. They would have filled something out that was done by the city using SurveyMonkey or something like this, but to hand over their, uh, their, their, their to have to register for this to, to Polco is very off-putting. And I think that accounts for why there, it somewhat accounts for why there's so few. I would like to hear at the end how many unique people attended and filled out, not how many, uh, like I, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, today's Zoom meeting shows 24 attendees, but only 15 of them are not city employees or people who are doing the presentation. You have 15 members of the public here. And um, I don't know about the other counts. Bill Frazier gave me an account, a very large count for one of the previous Zooms. I'll bet that included quite a few people who are working for the city or on the project. 
And I'm, I will bet that most of the people who have come to these sessions are also the people who filled out, filled out the uh, survey. So how many people are actually uh, uh, involved in this public engagement process? I think it's not very many, and I'm disappointed in the result because these sessions have been great. Thank you. Really noted, Peter, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions from the attendees today? We have, again, um, an FAQ on the website. So a lot of questions, actually some of the questions that have been asked today are actually in that um, document so they can be referenced. And again, please do send this to your, your neighbors and constituents and friends. Eric. Eric. You just unmute yourself. I need to un thank unmute. You. Uh, yeah, thank you. Has, has anybody sort of gone up to 60,000 feet and figured out what the cost range is per unit on this and these various pieces? The cost I know to the build figures it. are vague and, and order of magnitude figures, but has anybody come up with any? Uh, that's one way, I think, to assess feasibility is to say, is this, are we going to end up with? affordable housing at any level with this. So you're saying the cost of the, uh, of the developers cost to build the units themselves is what you're saying? Cost plus the infrastructure. What's it going to cost the end purchaser for yeah. a unit? Yeah, we don't we don't have that information. And that was something um, that we were talking about earlier about market, the market information and the actual product going to be available in part because there it depends on so many factors that are beyond our no knowledge and in 2023 what i can say is that you know right now what we know from the housing data we have and the developer data we have is that the cost to build is just so astronomical and the amount of rent you can get in these in any market and you know the cost to build in Montpelier is the same it is as it is to cost in Callis but your rent is going to be very different so you've got these you know these inherent issues which is causing the housing crisis what the city is attempting to do with this process and like what the tool TIF tax increment financing does is it gets at reducing that infrastructure cost to a developer to help take that component out of the equation to enable affordable units to be developed because then the city owns its infrastructure. You still, it's still a public asset, but then this, the developer is not responsible. So if this were a private parcel, this developer would have to build all those roads, extend all that water sewer. And that's really, a, you know, that's why it's not, it, there wasn't another purchaser for this property that was a private developer who came in and beat out the city. The city got this, got this property. And if the city puts in the infrastructure, that could pave the way to being more affordable units. And to your point, Eric, I mean, that is absolutely the name of the game is to have a variety of affordable and workforce units um, that we, that's, part and parcel of the recommendations to be looking for while doing an RFP with a developer is, you know, more points awarded to developers who can show how these will become perpetually affordable or workforce, which is a different category, just to, to make that distinction. Workforce housing does not qualify under affordable definitions, but is meant to be at the market point of um, a lot more people that are, that are living here in, in the state currently. At, 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 at this point, you think it's uh, feasible and you can come up with some workforce and affordable housing in this? I honestly can't tell you today by today's numbers. We have not run them from a developer's scenario because, again, there's a lot of factors that need to go into that. And we need to actually engage in the partnerships and explore that with them. Because, for example, let me give you an example. If a developer came forward, we have these conceptual volumes, um, densities here. So we have 300 units in, let's call it round numbers, 300 units in scenario A. If a developer came back with 400 units that they could develop affordably and still minimize impact to climate, still minimize um, impact to taxpayers, and the, tax, the, the city was able to make that feasible, the city has the opportunity and has the flexibility to make that happen. So we can't be prescriptive and, and try to run the numbers on exactly this scenario now but rather pave the way and create the soil for these conversations to happen. And then the city will have to remain flexible and figure out what is the right blend to support these development projects that we wanna see happen under the terms we wanna see. 
The other thing that concerns me is that the uh, TIF financing, these uh, properties may not be producing taxes for a few years. Yep. And that seems like that would affect uh, the bonding and all of that. It does. That's that's an inherent um, part of TIF, though, um, Eric, that's actually pretty well uh, maneuvered because in every TIF district, you have this issue. Infrastructure has to be built before you can have the private development built. So you're going to have the cost and incur the debt before you see the revenue generation. So what they've done in the program, at least at the state level, and what a municipality would have to do is at that point, it's a cash flow issue. And you, you project how much increment or you're going to need and how much um, revenue you're going to you need generated to pay down that infrastructure debt and you have to float the cash debt service but there's ways to structure it with interest only bonds for a few years things like that that really bring down that annual cost but that get recouped with the TIF revenue over time so it's done in every district and that's just how it has to because there is a sequencing that you've identified there. It, it, one one more question is: uh, Have you considered a design competition with an award or prize? No, I've not specifically. It's one project, and it was very successful because you get a full range of kind of proposals. Um, and you're talking about design of the units themselves. The units, uh, the layout, the, the property, whatever. I mean, essentially, that's what the RFP process is. I mean, the RFP is going to need to come back to the city. The proposals need to come back to the city. And there's going to be a variety, I assume, of different concepts that come forward. Again, that's why the plan looks the way it does. It's conceptual and high level so that it allows for others to fill in the detail. And then it's a matter of deciding between them. They're not restricted to the uh, exact plans right. that you're developing. Exactly, exactly. So they, they have an entirely different concept for the property that met the requirements. Exactly, and meeting the requirements is the, is the you just hit the nail on the head. It's really a matter of, you know, in the, in the master plan, it's gonna hit the goals. What are the goals, the requirements for the plan and for the, for the land? And if you can hit those goals and do it in a different layout or a different style, great. I mean, we're not those designers. We're not those private entities that have that expertise at this time or know or know how to make that feasible in 2025, 27, 28. So it will make sense to, to leave it flexible, but as long as they hit these goals, um, that's the requirement. Thank it's you, Eric. Yeah. That if uh, there was a design competition, you might get a more innovative projects. And, and, you know, putting innovation as a high requirement as part of the RFP process is, is definitely part of it. And also putting design in there as a, um, you know, again, things that get them additional credit or points or consideration is what we're, what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, I think you're back, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, Eric, I just wanted to put this out there about... Um, innovative ideas that might really uh, have um, uh, impact on afford affordability. Um, for instance, the idea of tiny homes. Uh, it seems that there's a big appetite in our community for uh, tiny homes. And uh, I happen to know that um, the Norwich School of Architecture won design competition uh, for designing uh, affordable uh, but well designed uh, tiny homes that with zero, with net zero. So there, there's things out there also in White River, there was a, a bunch of um, companies, including, well, I happen to remember the um, Hanover Co-op was one, who are all faced with this workforce, severe workforce housing problems. And this is national, but, but what these companies did was they pooled money and then it was, um, I think it was leveraged by Eversource. And, um, and then, um, then housing was built specifically for worker, for local workers. Because right now in Montpelier, 
you know, for instance, at Hunger Mountain Co-op, people can't afford, many people can't afford to live in town. So they live far out or have to go somewhere else where the rents are cheaper. So there are these innovative things that can really affect the affordability. Yeah, you're referencing that, yeah, Ever North project. Yeah, in Ever North River. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But that is exactly a great example, Deborah, of like somebody who could come forward with something creatively packaged too, like a creative financing package of their own that says, here's what I need from the city, but here's how I'm gonna make it happen on my end. And, you know, these public-private partnerships are really symbiotic and they need to be, and they need to be dynamic and iterative because each, each municipality is different, but also, you know, each community is different. So each community's needs are different and these will evolve. And by the time, you know, this actually gets implementable in a few years. So yeah, we absolutely want to leave the door open for that creativity. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? We're a little bit of time, but again, Josh's information is on the website. He's happy to you know, receive your questions and comments. Um, please do take the survey if you can. Please encourage others to take the survey to go to the website. Um, and then we have a city council meeting on the 24th, but the June 28th meeting is going to be a big one where we get to unveil the um, actionable master plan. and. Um, all the recommendations that the team has put together over the course of the year. And capturing, that document will capture the feedback we've gotten along the way and the process along the way as well. So hopefully giving a, um, it's a living document. We don't want it sitting on the shelf. That is the main point. I, that kills me a little to imagine it sitting on a shelf after all this work we put in. So um, that's why it's focused very much actionable on the things that the city needs to take on next. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, everybody, for participating today. We really appreciate it on such a beautiful day. Enjoy the rest of your day.